Okay, so today I am excited to introduce myofascial release. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful resources in your module uh, for myofascial release. I see that many people are already participating in the discussion forum based on the sloth massage video. Um, if you haven't done that, um, I definitely um, highly recommend you actually follow the sloth video and do the MFR um, in the real speed along with him in the video because it'll start to give you a little bit of a sense in your hands and in your own body about myofascial release that is gonna help lab make a lot more sense. Um, and our first lab is Wednesday and Thursday. And basically from now till the end of the program, we're gonna be using myofascial release a lot. Um, somebody needs to mute themselves. Whoever just joined us, thank you. Um, so we're gonna start off our first about four to six labs um, doing some general different myofascial release techniques and then certain areas, including entire fascial lines, which is very exciting, those anatomy trains. Um, and then once we get a solid foundation in that, we will continue to use myofascial release as we do specific treatments for different um, postural issues, different injuries, like, um, you know, it can be very helpful for things like uh, plantar fasciitis and um, all, all sorts of issues. Um, before I just kind of roll along here, from your introduction to the module, um, are there sort of any burning questions or things that you were not understanding from your textbook assignment or the module? Um, any questions? Okay, so today is just an introductory lecture and um, we'll keep learning, we'll keep layering on to your understanding of MFR through labs and um, uh, actually in anatomy and physiology um, when we get deeper into the muscles and when we get into a fascial um, section, we'll, we'll just keep getting deeper and deeper with our understanding. So it's okay, don't, don't worry if it doesn't all make sense right away. So fascia is the web that connects everything. And um, as you saw in the dissection video in today's kinesiology lab, you know, there are some layers of fascia, you know, that are, are thicker, uh, separations between muscles, uh, but there's also uh, fascia at all different layers um, surrounding different layers of muscle and um, connecting muscles to bones, and it's all the same type of fascial webbing. Um, so I thought these were some pretty great pictures kind of of some of the different sort of arrangements of the fascia. Um, and um, like this one here on the left, would be the sort of fascia that, that you could have, uh, you could see a buildup, you know, if you play like a, any kind of a sport where you do a repeated motion, like let's say a pitcher for baseball, um, anything or any kind of a, a serving motion, if you keep doing the same motion over and over again, your body's going to create extra layers of fascia for stabilization. That's true whether you're doing a movement repeatedly, like a sport where you're always, you know, serving with one, you know, the same motion. And it's also true for sustained motions. So whatever postures we're in regularly. And so what your body will do is use extra fascia to uh, support those postural patterns. So myofascial release is great for a lot of things. Uh, anytime there's neuromuscular pain, anytime there's postural issues. Um, so even if a client is coming in because of pain or lack of range of motion or, you know, and they don't even mention, you know, oh, I want to work on my posture, right? There might be a postural issue 
behind a problem, even if they're not saying, hey, I want to improve my posture. So you're assessing uh, when you see how they're sitting, how they're walking, how they're holding themselves. And another great example is if they're injured, you know, and they're having a protective uh, pattern of, um, you know, a protective pattern, they're going to have uh, some fascial issues there. Uh, does this bring up questions so far? All right, so there is a um, chapter in your book, if you haven't read it yet, um, it's not that long, uh, page 588 to 604, and you can skip topic 20-3, so it's not even the entire chapter. Um, so make sure you go through that um, and uh, look at some basic concepts like um, the um, fascial layers in the anatomy, um, thixotrophy, physioelasticity, piezoelasticity, planes, bands, and chains. Well, let's start in the module and some of that, we'll get into some of that already. So myofascial release, um, and here's a great picture of some fascia, um, is a great technique. Um, now, there's a lot of techniques that massage therapists use that we sort of um, developed or borrowed um, from other modalities. And I would say the most uh, developed uh, folks who are using uh, myofascial release that we basically sort of you know, learned our techniques from um, are the Rolfers originally. Um, and there's a very famous, you know, the, the Rolfing is named after Ida Rolf. Um, this is the founder of Rolfing. Um, and um, Rolfing is famous as a very deep technique. Um, and um, traditionally, it's done in a series of 10 um, treatments that work through the body systematically so irregardless of what the problem is, uh, you'd have a whole series of 10 treatments that would work through um, all the fascia and you know, really work with your movement and alignment very well. Um, and some of their techniques are you know, what we got our myofascial release from. Now, as massage therapists, we can practice myofascial release but we cannot practice rolfing. So if you want to become a rolfer, you have to go to rolfing school. And um, there's actually two main, two main modalities, like rolfing was the first one. And then as it often happens in massage therapy, you know, there might be one founding instructor like Ida Rolf who developed it. Um, and then sometimes, you know, the primary initial students, sometimes they'll split off into some groups who further develop in a certain direction. So now there's a couple different similar schools um, like that. Are there questions so far? Okay. Have you ever, Zephyr, have you ever heard of Heller work? Is Rolfing similar to Heller work? Oh, yeah. So um, they have some similarities in working with the fascia. Um, Heller work also uh, works with the breath a lot and is one of those techniques that's considered a uh, somatic technique that sort of integrates some of the um, like psychology principles. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Sharice might have studied Heller work. And you'll get a couple MFR labs with her. So I'd ask her as well. She did. She was telling me about it the other day. Yeah. So maybe ask her deeper on that one. I haven't studied Heller work. All right. So fascia is um, flexible and it's constantly remodeling and adapting to changing stresses. And it can lose flexibility uh, to injury. 
um, overuse, underuse, um, poor posture. Um, and these are some great pictures of, um, you know, if you're separating muscles and you have this great uh, fascia between them. Uh, this picture on the upper right is actually a picture of the sternum. This right here would be the sternum. And this is fascinating. Stay with me, folks, how I mentioned about fascia actually changing how it lays itself down depending on how you use your body. So like if you're right-handed, um, this fascial line you could see is more developed in this direction. And that would be indicative of somebody who's right-handed. Um, maybe they are, you know, throwing a football or something. Um, so you can see that fascial difference there. And then here's some other cross sections, you know, where you could see the fascial separations, you know, in a cross cut of, um, you know, this could be a cross cut of an of a arm or a leg or something. Um, and you can see this, I'm sorry to the vegetarians and vegans in the crowd, but, um, you know, if you do cook meat especially, I mean, you can see it to some degree if somebody else cooks the meat for you. But um, once you cook the meat, it uh, denatures the proteins. Um, and so, and of course it changes also what's going on with, with the fluids and so forth. Um, so you don't get quite the same sense. I mean, you can still take like a rotisserie chicken and really see how the bones go into the tendons go, you know, and how the joint capsules are and so forth. So to some extent, you can still explore it. But I what I would really recommend even more than exploring, say, a cooked rotisserie chicken is to explore any cuts of meat like an uncooked rotisserie chicken, uh, pork or cow shoulder or rump roast. And, and you'll really see like this bottom right, you know, where the fascial separations are and then also how the muscles go into tendons. And it's, it's a really great uh, study. Um, does that bring up any questions or comments? So I mentioned posture, you know, this is probably, you know, unless, you, you know, if you work with a lot of athletes or folks who are pretty active in whatever exercise they do, you'll definitely see overuse injuries in your clinic. And even if you see another thing that's very common is sort of the weekend warrior syndrome, you know, somebody who's not very active, and then all of a sudden they like take up basketball on the weekend um, or it's around New Year's and they've got these New Year's resolutions and maybe they're pushing their body in a way they hadn't before. You know, you definitely can see some fascial issues as well as trigger point issues in those cases, definitely. And the other one that you're just going to see a lot of is people developing um, fascial issues because of poor posture. And so what we see a lot now, so many people uh, working from their homes during COVID, um, not having good office situations in their homes and having, you know, poor posture while they're sitting at their um, kitchen table, let's say, and that's where I'm at right now, instead of having like an office set up and they might be hunching more, um, and people using their phones so much, um, so much so that there's a whole study around what people call tech neck. But whether you're looking at a computer with poor posture or a phone with poor posture, um, this picture is a pretty good example. Um, this x-ray picture, you know, where you get your head forward and this horrible angle um, for your neck and all of this hunching. And so you're gonna get internal rotation of your shoulders. You're gonna get a lot of strain in the suboccipital area. You're gonna get a lot of strain um, and shortening up here in the anterior chest. And so you get a combination of stretched long, weak muscles and short, tight, overworked muscles. And in both cases, it's also affecting the fascia. Does that bring up questions or comments? 
All right. So um, working with myofascial release is really great at restoring and increasing range of motion and also helping when there's been um, injuries. A lot of times people don't really do full rehabilitation to get full restoration of where they were at before the injury. Now, very serious athletes will do that, right? But a lot of folks will just kind of get to that point where they just kind of want to get past the initial pain and maybe they don't really um, deal with the full aspect. And so a lot of us, as we age and as we have more and more injuries behind us, get more and more restricted range of motion. Um, and so MFR is a great way to really resolve some of those old injuries and really increase the range of motion and flexibility. And some of that, there's a lot of aspects to this MFR, but some of that will be from addressing compensatory patterns, which could be, you know, just uh, antalgic gait, and that refers to like, let's say you're in pain. And so you're kind of walking around, kind of shuffling or limping and guarding and protecting the part of yourself that is injured. So that antalgic gait refers to that changed way of walking uh, when you're in pain. And that could be, you know, with or without crutches, right? I mean, obviously there's a compensatory pattern if somebody is literally having to go on crutches or one of those carts where they have to wheel around their leg, obvious changes in their movement patterns. But even if they never were on crutches, uh, you know, there's a protective uh, change in pattern and movement with one side overcompensating and the other side um, being protected and massage can help uh, resolve and balance that. Um, any questions or comments or personal experiences related to this at this point? I do have a question actually. So you had mentioned um, for like a baseball pitcher, you know, they build up the extra fascia to um, help stabilize that. Is that something you would want to work through the same way you're talking about like um, the extra fascia you can build for compensating for an injury or do you want to kind of leave that alone because that's helping them stay stable and healthy for lack of better term yeah that's a great question um you know you don't want to imbalance things like say especially not right before their uh sports events so a great example is like sports massage part of what we do is during the training to work with the athlete and that during their training can be a time to really work with their balance but let's say let's use the example of a runner um, if they're about to run a marathon um, that is not the time like right before their run is not the time to do mfr because we don't want to destabilize uh, the patterns that they have in play but we can work with them during their training phases because everyone except the most sophisticated, you know, let's say Olympic level athlete is also developing poor movement patterns. So we can work with them on improving it, uh, but we're not wanting to, you know, destabilize, um, you know, their protective mechanisms. Does that make sense or are there follow up questions? Uh, so what you're saying is basically, yes, we want to work through it, but you have to be careful when you do it because you don't want to destabilize right before they are trying to use it. Is that, is that what I'm getting? I would say that would be like the first part of the answer. Yes. And then also you definitely want to really know what you're doing and really know your kinesiology and your postural assessment and your movement assessment, uh, because you don't want to ever destabilize something that is in place, you know, protectively, like um, that they're needing. Um, but there can be things that are in place that are uh, dysfunctional. 
So they may have fascial patterns that have developed that are um, connecting two muscles that should be separate and that's interrupting the range of movement possibility and that's something good to open up. But uh, if uh, the pitcher, as an example, you know, they're needing to really stabilize their rotator cuff, you're not wanting to ever destabilize the fascia around their rotator cuff. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. And, and, but yeah, a lot of times folks will also develop like that extra scar tissue. And so that can be part of the fascial release that we can do after the scar tissue has stabilized enough. Um, a very rough estimate of what's going on is if there's a, you know, a cut or a tear, the body will kind of haphazardly throw down this connective tissue. And once it is stabilized and healed enough, um, then we can work with our linear friction and our cross fiber friction, which will help organize that connective tissue mess um, so that really the, the most stabilizing directional forces are protected rather than connecting a bunch of things that shouldn't be connected. So we can even help remove or you know facilitate the decrease in old scars for example <clears throat> which is you know excessive connective tissue does that uh bring up questions for folks okay we'll talk about some of the basic mfr techniques and again this will this part will make a lot more sense in lab and we will be going through specific anatomy trains and so forth down the road. Um, so it's not like you have to memorize it all at once. But as far as the basic MFR technique, and if you follow the um, sloth video, that's a really good example of, you know, a slow MFR where you take the tissue into a stretch and then slowly follow unwinding patterns while it melts. And getting that tissue warmed up um, utilizes that thixotrophic effect where you're really warming up and changing that ground substance so that that change can happen more quickly. Now, you can do this at any level of the tissue. So this could be done with the fascia that's so superficial, it's really just below the skin. And some MFR people will call that your skin bag. Um, or you could go to the deepest fascia, for example, between the radius and the ulna, between those two bones is that interosseous membrane, that's fascia too. You could get in there um, and work that fascia, as well as all the layers in between. Um, you can get very uh, broad with that, like here's a sort of a classic, this picture up here is sort of a classic, like crossing the hands and slowly stretching the tissue. Um, or you can get into more specific techniques where you're really following specific lines as thin as with your thumbs or, you know, your ulnar surface. Skin rolling is interesting because it is considered both a type of petrissage as well as a type of uh, fascial release. So you can use skin rolling to warm up fascia, to assess fascia, to treat fascia, but only the superficial layers. And we'll definitely show you some in lab and let you practice with it. It's not most people's favorite technique. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that anybody's like, oh my God, that feels amazing. Um, but if you do it carefully and you slow down where you're supposed to, um, it can be an effective technique just for the superficial fascia. Questions so far? Now, um, I want to clarify something that a lot of massage practitioners don't really have straight in their minds. Um, most massage therapists, I would say, if they think about fascial release, think about direct fascial techniques. So there's 
two primary differences. There's direct and indirect. And most massage therapists think about direct. And so the difference is if you take a fascial tightness and you stretch it in the direction of that resistance and that tightness, that's called direct. But you can also do fascial techniques where you take the tightness and instead of stretching against the tightness, you actually bring those ends together and that's called indirect. And they're both myofascial release and they can both be done at different levels of the body. Um, the direct technique, people then often ask like, is one better than the other? Is there a reason you would choose one over the other? The direct technique um, feels more to most people like you're getting work done. It might have that burning feeling or that good pain feeling or that stretchy feeling. And so especially for clients who like deep tissue or they like that feeling of, of deep work, um, those kind of clients are gonna feel like you're doing more when you're doing direct work. But the indirect can be just as effective or even more effective. And so that can also be good for the clients who are more sensitive, um, who don't need that feeling of you know, intensity. Like if you do something intense, they actually get really guarded. So maybe in some cases, you know, folks who are um, easily triggered or experiencing trauma and so forth, um, sensitive folks as well, they might prefer the indirect. And what you can also do is mix the two up because sometimes a particular pattern will respond better to indirect or direct. And so if it's the kind of client who feels like more intense it is getting more work done, you can do enough of the intense techniques so they feel like you're getting something done, but then oftentimes it's that indirect work that actually gets more to unwind. And very similar to indirect technique of fascia is actually any of the positional release techniques um, like orthobiotomy, which are really awesome and wonderful, and I will teach you some of that. Um, so does that bring up questions? So the myofascial release um, works really well. Sorry, this somehow is overlapping this one word, but it works really well with many other techniques. Um, many massage therapists um, include it in treatment sessions um, for specific injuries, um, medical massage. Many will include it, um, combining it with other things like um, uh, trigger point release work, which is often called neuromuscular therapy, muscle energy techniques like reciprocal inhibition, stretching, including pin and stretch, uh, the positional release technique I just mentioned, um, and then, you know, Swedish, um, Feldenkrais, um, any, any kind of work really, it can be combined. Many people do myofascial release with no lotion or oil or just a little lotion or oil. So sometimes massage therapists will use this technique first if they're going to do other, you know, techniques that use lotion or oil later. But there because myofascial release works better when the tissue's already warmed up. There are ways to do still your Swedish or other warm up techniques and then do your MFR even if you've applied lotion or oil first. And I, one thing I like to do is to use lotion rather than oil because it will absorb by the time you've warmed things up and then you can get more traction. Um, and I'll show you other techniques that work in lab. You can also, um, we haven't used this as much yet in lab, but you can also really take advantage of those hot packs. And I noticed in um, the discussion board for the um, MFR and the hot stone massage that um, people were really calling that out for the hot stone as well, how it really you know, warms up and melts the tissue and you're really using that thixotrophic effect. So you, know, you can use the warm stones and hot packs and so forth um, because it will get your MFR work done faster 
if you've warmed up the tissue. You can also use your compression uh, to warm it up. So does that bring up questions? It's gonna work super well in conjunction, as I said, with the neuromuscular therapy and trigger points is actually what we're gonna study next after we get enough MFR. Um, and then uh, we'll do a little bit more with reciprocal inhibition. Um, the muscle energy techniques, um, they're not energy like Reiki or energetic modalities like that. They're all things that um, physical therapists would use. So they're things like having the person contract a muscle while you resist or having them contract the antagonist muscle um, and, and do those kind of active movements. So um, as I said, this can really increase range of motion. These are some other techniques. Um, so just a little more overview, um, you know, we're really gonna wanna start looking at the whole patterns, you know, and you believe it or not, you do have enough uh, palpation skills now to really start taking this to the next level. So we're gonna be looking at functional patterns and lines of fascial connections. Now, instead of looking at each individual muscle separately. Um, so you can really start to think about lines of force. And if somebody has an issue um, you know, in their low back, where can that be coming, um, coming from in their, um, in, their, in their standing or in their walking and so forth. So a couple things about communication and caution around myofascial release is that it doesn't feel the same as say a relaxing Swedish massage. Um, so it's good to talk to your client about you know, what you're gonna do and why, and if that sounds good to them, and then what types of sensations they might expect and what they should report to you. Um, so for example, some massage therapists will do superficial MFR for a very long time at the beginning of the massage. And my personal take on that is that, um, you know, that kind of takes a very long time just to be working on superficial fascia and it doesn't feel that great. So I think it's better, you know, to be integrating other techniques and to get to different layers of fascia. So we'll definitely teach you how to do that. Um, as I said, you don't use lotion or oil. Um, so you can also, as you're stretching the fascia and facilitating releases, uh, sometimes, as I mentioned, it can feel kind of like a burning sensation, um, or it might even feel like a good pain. But in both cases, just like any other massage, you can monitor you know, are they tightening up their face muscles or scrunching their eyes or resisting other muscles, tightening other muscles in reaction? That's a sign that whatever you're doing is, is too deep, even if they're telling you it's good, right? Because a lot of clients have this no pain, no gain idea. And the good pain and burning can both be at a, you know, enjoyable depth that the person can breathe into and relax into and not tighten up their other muscles in garden, guarding. Um, does that bring up any questions or comments? Okay, and so the MFR is gonna unwind and lengthen and stretch muscles. So we want to especially do this on the areas that are too tight and glued together and short. Um, so an area that's really stretched out already, we're not going to want to do the lengthening MFR, you know, to really stretch that area out even more. And I think a classic example of this, because it's so common, is when people do have, you know, rounded shoulders, their back is going to have that hyperkyphotic big curve and their um, scapula are going to be coming forward. So we don't want to stretch their scapula even further forward. Instead, we want to take those muscles and fascia that are short and tight and stretch those. 
So in that case of the classic rhomboids, the person could still have pain in their rhomboids, which is super, super common, and they could still have trigger points in their rhomboids, which is also super, super common. But what we want to do is not work those out in a long, stretchy way. Instead, we could just really isolate, you know, along that lateral border, uh, excuse me, medial border of the scapula and really work out those trigger points without further stretching the rhomboids. Any questions? No. Okay. So we have just a few minutes left and I think we're at a, at a, at a pretty good introduction here. I want to call out a few things in the module in case anybody has not gotten there. As I mentioned, uh, please definitely watch this um, sloth video. And um, as you walk through the introduction, you know, it'll talk to you about, you know, these fascial patterns. And then this video, like I said, is going to walk you through doing this on yourself and then participate in the discussion, which over the over half of the class is already done. But it's not too late to join us if you haven't yet. There are um, some other great introductory videos in the module. Please make sure you watch the famous fuzz speech. How many of you have seen the famous fuzz speech already in the module? I've seen it. Oh my God, it was so funny. Yeah, he's, he's hilarious, right? Uh, so that's, that kind of gives you one sense of, you know, that, that sticky um, fascia. All right, so these are some sort of quotes and I just want to call it to your attention in case, you know, sometimes you see a PowerPoint and you just skip through it. Um, but what I've done is I've pulled out some important segments from the chapter and then I've written notes, uh, my own notes on these pages. So it's a good thing to take some time with. But let's take a look at some of the overall organization of this fascia. Um, and again, we're gonna do this in different ways at different levels, including back in anatomy and physiology after we get a couple chapters in. So when we talk about fascia being a web that connects everything, it's also useful to really picture it as layers around structures. So individual um, muscle, uh, the individual fibrils that make up uh, muscle fibers, every one of those muscle fiber, which is a muscle cell, is wrapped in fascia. And then you take those different, each individually wrapped in fascia, you take those different muscle cells and you wrap those together in fascia and now it's a fascicle. And you take hundreds of those fascicles which are each wrapped in fascia and they're made up of fibers each wrapped in fascia and you bundle those together and guess what? You wrap them in fascia. And that is a muscle. It's a big old muscle with this fascia, 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 right? Um, and then you take those individual muscles and you also separate those from each other muscles also wrapped in fascia. So we have all these fascial layers. And at the end, you know, let's say of a muscle that ends in a tendon, um, that all comes out, right, as this um, tendon of the fascia. So that's kind of the layers just around a muscle, but then there's different layers of fascia all around, you know, the superficial layer of skin. And so some of the areas of the body, the fascia is more thin and spider webby and other areas it's very thick and dense like a tendon or a ligament or an aponeurosis. So very cool. Questions on this part? Okay, there's something in the chat. Is it something I should know about? Okay, because of all these layers wrapped in fascia, you literally cannot touch a muscle without touching fascia. So you're already doing fascial massage, but now we're gonna teach you techniques that help you really um, unwind that fascia 
and and work well with the properties of the um, basha and also the um, you know the different um, connections and trains of the fascia so there's this great analogy of you know cutting a grapefruit or any kind of citrus fruit and you know you have these individual separations you know between the triangles and if you've ever you know pulled them apart that covering just an analogy, obviously not made of the same exact material, but that's kind of like the muscles separated by fascia. But then if you were to take that apart even more, I don't know if you've ever played with it, but there's little segments in there that are also wrapped in fascia. So it's just an analogy. The muscle's not uh, organized exactly like a grapefruit, but it's a similar type of organization. And because of all of these connections, people often use an analogy that if you were to have tight bound up fascia anywhere in the body, that's going to translate to other parts of the body. And so they use this analogy of tugging on a sweater. And if you've ever, you know, had like a thread come out of your sweater, and if you pull on it, it really is pulling from all these parts of the sweater, and that's not a way to deal with the thread coming out of your sweater, right? Which um, I think since it's time to wrap up class, I just want to call out another very important video in the module. If you haven't watched it yet, there's a video about, it's called Strolling Under the Skin. And it's a live video of a camera underneath the skin, uh, but it really talks about how the fascia works. And while there is certain terminology in the video that's not gonna make sense, please stick through the whole video and actually watch it because it's mind blowing and it will change how you understand fascia because you'll see how the fascia actually can make changes in real time to respond to loads on the tissue. And it's, it's beautiful and fascinating. Yeah. So any last questions or comments before we wrap it up for the day? Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. And um, we're going to get this in our hands a lot in lab, um, including a lab to really feel that thixotrophic effect in, in process. Um, but this is one of the most important concepts to be a good massage therapist, especially if you want to do treatment work. So if you've skipped any of the sections in this module, especially the strolling under the skin video or um, the, um, the fuzz speech um, or this PowerPoint, uh, please take the time to look at that as well as the chapter in the book because it's going to change how you can do massage if you actually understand fascia instead of just, you know, sort of randomly doing MFR techniques on the body. So thank you everybody and um, reminder that tomorrow's lab, oh, excuse me, tomorrow is Zoom Anatomy and Physiology Cytology. Um, and um, uh, remember to go into Sharice's room for that. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. See thank you. Bye everybody. Bye.